Hey gang, how's it going? We're back out in the shop today, and uh, today we got a guest speaker. His name is Scott. He owns Patriot Welding here in my local town. And um, can you guys hear me? I'm seeing you now. Okay, there's, there's, a, there's buffering. Yeah, there's a delay, apparently. There's a delay. Um, Anyway, like I said, we're back out in the shop today. We're going to do a little welding. Got a good friend of mine, um, Scott. He's with Patriot Welding. He owns a company. It's a, what, three-year startup? Uh, about five or six. About five or six, is it? Um, we, uh, I'll do some stuff in here in the shop and show you guys a few things. And then um, we'll ease outside and do a little tour of Scott's equipment and truck. But uh, first off, I want to say hi to everybody. Get my glasses where I can see. Actually. I bet. Uh, I see Mayhem's here, Swanjin, Carl H. Good to see you guys. Toka Selected. Um, Scott Guitars. Scott Guitars. Oh, I got, I got a note. Uh, what did I do that? Yeah, Scott, I didn't forget about you, buddy. I, I made myself a note, and uh, I'll go over all my notes here in a little bit and, uh, and help you out. That's Roll Tide, true. Katrina. Dutchman's back. All right, good to have you, Dutchman. Glad to have you. They're still piling in. There's Simon Foray. But anyway, uh, Flagford, I hope Lamb shows up because as you can see, I've got his flag flying today. That's the flag of Wales for y'all that don't know. And I hope I got it right. I had to turn the flag. It's actually backwards on the wall because the video turns the flag around and it looks like it's hanging the wrong way. So uh, let me know, you guys comment, does it look like it's, you know, hanging and flying the right way? It's like it's like a nice flag, so maybe it's right. L Lammy will straight Yeah, Lam so. Lammy will come in. I'm sure he'll let me know. Uh, but anyway, on with the subject. So last time you guys were with me, <clears throat> we were doing the, the uh, pop rivets, or the uh, bucking rivets. And we did do a couple of pop rivets, so you may recognize these parts. I just cut them up because today I want to go over a few different ways of welding, styles of welding, type of welding. I'll show you some good welds, some bad welds, and uh, just any questions you guys got, you know, just shoot them out there. But um, so the first piece I'll talk about is this aluminum. Um, when you weld aluminum, there are several ways to weld it. Uh, you can use gas with certain rods. You can use wire like I do. Uh, you can use a TIG welder, Heliar. There are several different ways to do it. Uh, my machine is a uh, spool-fed aluminum wire um, welder. And it makes a weld. Here's a bad weld, because I had the air conditioner blowing. You can see how rough it looks. It looks pretty rough. Then I'll flip it over to a better weld right here. So I've got a couple of... Yeah, go ahead. Simon is answering the question. Okay. Apparently, you got the flag back. It, no. Can you see it? He says the Welsh flag is on the right side of the wall. Yeah. Okay. It's on the right side of the wall. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
flame resistant. Flame resistant, sure. Doesn't mean you can't blow holes in it. Right. It just means it won't spontaneously right. combust. It will burn through. It just won't catch fire per se. Um, but anyway, so a guy at work gave me some welding rods and um, a few of the rods, I know what they are and I've used them in the past, but there's a couple here that I've never used. So uh, it'd be interesting to see how my little welding machine, um, how I have to adjust the machine to, to make them burn and then to see what type of material uh, the welding rod is. Um, I got a sneaky suspicion that this welding rod is a 116. I got a sneaky suspicion that it's a brother to the 7018, which they use a lot in pipeline welding for gas lines and stuff, you know, such as that. I have no idea what these are. There's no numbers on them. They're blue. I will tell you, in my experience in the past, when you get rods that are actually kind of pretty with colors and stuff like that, a lot of times they're stainless or some other you know, non-ferrous metal of some kind. I don't know why they do that, but uh, but at any rate, you can see the boxes right here. These are the four boxes that he gave me, and uh, I'll be making at least one weld with each stick. So we'll see what they do. So it'll be kind of a learning curve for me as well. Uh, Carl seems to think you're working with sparklers today. Uh, that's gonna, you're going to see some sparkles, that's for sure. And Dutchman has a question. Where is your leather protector clothing while welding? I probably should wear that, but I don't. Um, it's in my truck. <laughs> it's in the truck. Yeah, we'll go get it later. Um, safety third. Yeah, safety third, you know. But uh, I got my pants on. That's the best I can do, okay? I got long pants on. <clears throat> but anyway, I'm going to roll this welder. This is the aluminum welder I was telling you guys about. I'm going to roll it over here. I'll move these chairs, plug it in, and we'll make our first weld. So you guys can check it out. While you're setting up, Swanson wants to know if it's a Miller welding machine. I think I know the answer, but I'll let you know. Mine or all Lincoln? Lincoln, okay. So this is machine number one. This is my welding or my aluminum setup. It uses pure argon and a spool gun instead of the normal torch you're probably used to seeing. Yeah, before we uh, engage in the actual activity of gluing two pieces of metal together, so to speak, we can't proceed without a, uh, at least a brief discussion on personal protective equipment. What I've done is I brought in some of my items that I normally wear when I'm on a job on location. First of all, one of the most important things you can have is a good welding helmet. Don't be afraid to spend money on your helmet. This is about a $300 to $400 helmet. And the reason being is with the technology they have these days, you need to be able to see the puddle. If you can't see the puddle, you can't weld. So this allows you a lot better visibility than the older helmets, the cheap helmets. So don't be afraid to spend a little bit of money, plus also the protection. The other thing that you can get is a, a bib that comes down in front of this thing that protects you from the ultraviolet rays. Believe me, you will get sunburned, so to speak, when you're welding. Secondly, respirators. Welding, because of all the flex material that's on these, uh, sticks, 
and also the uh, gases that are used and also the uh, uh, the smoke and fumes that are emitted just from the welding process, it's very dangerous, so you need to wear the proper respirator. These are designed to fit under the helmet. They're made by Miller. And of course, the leather jacket. This one's a combination, cloth and leather, flame resistant. Now here in Alabama, the problem that we have, I wear a shirt like this. Uh, most of the time is that not too long from now, probably what, about another month or so, we're going to start feeling yeah. the effects of the uh, wonderful humidity here in southeast Alabama. So sometimes, sometimes I will forego the shirt because of the heat and the humidity, mm -hmm. but I do have sleeves that I can use when I'm wearing a t-shirt. So that's just some of the equipment. We could probably save that for a discussion later on. And also sometimes when I'm in a confined space where I don't have room to wear the helmet, I have a self-auto-darkening -darken, face mask shield. I like that. That's cool. That uh, you wear a hood with, a flame-resistant hood with, and it does everything that the uh, large helmet does. But PPE is uh, an item that you don't want to uh, go cheap on because your life depends on it. Your eyesight, your lungs. So take it seriously. That was very informative. Scott, I appreciate you doing that. Uh, and by the way, Mark B is here. Hey, Mark. And gloves. And your little welding beanies. There's a lot of sparks. And they get on top of your head, especially those older older folks like uh, the captain and me. We have some bald patches up top, and this kind of protects yes. our noggins. And it absorbs some sweat because it, it is hot. It does get hot, that is for sure. All right, Captain, take it away. All right. Let me adjust this air real quick. Are you warm? No, it blows the uh, a welder gas. Okay. Don't be gassing me out over here in my little corner. All right, guys, I'm back. I'm going to move you guys over to a stand, and I'm going to try to set it up where you guys can actually see the weld while I'm welding it. No, I got a fire extinguisher right over behind me. <laughs> I thought ahead. So I'm just going to do a uh, just a lap weld to join them together, and uh, I'll make two welds. Hopefully, I can get the camera to where you guys can see. Guys, hang on. Yeah, sorry about that. Just can't really find a good angle for this thing. All right, I'm going to make this weld here first. Now, when you're welding aluminum, uh, it's very, very important that it's clean. And you can see it's fairly clean. But you want to take a stainless steel brush, a dedicated stainless steel brush. Yeah, nothing else will work. It has to be stainless steel, and you can't use it for anything else. What happens if you use your brush on anything else, you get contaminants on the, uh, on the stainless steel brush. And whenever you're trying to clean your part, you're steadily cramming in contaminated material. So you use a dedicated brush to clean your material with. And you'll, you can see, I think you can see, it just shines it up a little bit. And it breaks the top layer of aluminum. There's a scale on there mm -hmm. that when you weld, if you don't break that loose, uh, the weld will be ugly. It'll look like that. And that's not what we're shooting for. Alright. Alright. Now my gloves are a little different than Scott's because most everything I work on in here is super small and thin. 
he's got some pretty pretty awesome machinery and when he does some heavy welding it's it's a lot different than what I do all right I hope I got this gun set up I haven't used it in quite some time I made some uh, well passes the other day with it just to set it up we'll see pretty quick but at any rate No, it is not set up. Hand me that ground right there, Scott, on the bar. The first one. I'll try to reground it. Tip. Don't forget your gas. Turn the gas on. Shielding gas. All right. In case it's 100% argon. Okay. Yeah, let me, let me see here. We're going to... Call your state again. Y'all time for a question. Yeah, go ahead. Simon wants to know, is it a correct statement that aluminum is always oxidizing constantly? Yes. Yes, that, that is. is correct then, Simon. <laughs> and when you apply electricity in aluminum wire and the gas is turned on, it usually wells instead of puddling up like that. Also to add to that, when you do prepare your aluminum for welding, you use a brush and it should be a dedicated stainless steel brush that's only used for aluminum. And the way that you brush it should be one way in one direction, not both ways, because you're just taking that oxidation and burrowing it furrow, uh, uh, further into the uh, pores of the aluminum. Aluminum is very fickle. This it is. This is going to be an ugly weld because I'm welding over a bad piece anyway, but I'll flip it over and see if I can make up for it. Now that I got the machine set up and it's welding a lot better, I'm going to go ahead and weld this side. This is kind of an ugly side, so we won't talk about it too much. Yeah, man. Yeah, the spool gun, you're never going to get as pretty of a weld with it. On these smaller machines like this, that's just about the best you're going to get. Um, my machine is a 110, and if any of you ever buy a welder, buy a 220, and here's why. The weld, this weld, not that gobbled up crap, this weld here, it, it's, it would be strong, it'll hold, it'll do just fine. But because the machine only runs 110, it can't weld hot enough to get the flow and the puddle that I like. Okay? You brush that right there. There you go, you can see that a little bit better. And that'll really point out whenever I do uh, my wire welder, it'll be a lot better looking weld and you'll be able to see what a quality weld looks like. Shielding gas? No, no shielding, shielding gas. gas. That's right. So the air we breathe is just like 2% oxygen. It's not much at all. Uh, you got all kind of other gases out there in our atmosphere. Well, when you weld uh, with a unshielded wire, all of those particles, do, or all of those um, other um, elements cause a lot of holes and bubbles and all of that, what you're seeing here. And the shielded gas goes around whatever you're welding and protects that area to where there's no other elements other than the argon. And argon is heavier than uh, the air that we breathe. That's why you don't weld in confined spaces with argon because it displaces the air of the oxygen. And because of its weight, that's what it's doing as it uh, is ejected out the nozzle. It displaces the ambient air to protect that molten puddle. 
Now, right across from us, we have an air conditioner blowing. Any type of cross breeze that blows through here, uh, you can actually see it affect the weld puddle. It'll spit and sputter and do all kinds of things. So the best thing you can do is try to shield yourself from any kind of uh, breezes when you're welding. Right. Glasses. Now one thing on, on, a, on a spool gun for welding aluminum, um, here in a minute Scott will probably talk to you about your puddle, the way that you want to move the rod and make your puddle. Okay, on a spool gun you run it more like a caulking gun. Once you pull the trigger you want to be on the go. The aluminum is penetrating plenty deep enough and if you stay in one spot it will burn through. I'm going to demonstrate a slow heavy weld and let you see what I'm talking about burning through. And you should be pushing that well, not pulling it, pushing with, with the aluminum. Right. You want to push the weld. Okay. Yeah. And as y'all were doing this, and it looks at the inside okay. and made a comment. Basically, how to stop yourself from welding the clamp to the workpiece. Yeah, I don't want to weld the clamp to it. <laughs> All right, this time I'm going to slow it down. I'm going to put a lot of heat on it because I want to show you what happens if you put too much heat on aluminum. Um, and you'll notice I got a little gap. I got a little gap. Let's see. I kind of want. You know what I'm trying to do, right? Let it molt through. Mm -hmm. All right. I brush it off a little bit. If you move too slow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm going to use a, right, I'm going to go real slow, a hot setting, and uh, it may look pretty on one side, but it won't look so good on the other. That's actually hard to do. Mm -hmm. All right, so you can see it's a much bigger puddle, a lot more aluminum that I applied to the part. You guys can't really see that. Where I welded, on this edge, right here where I welded, there's a hump. Okay, and what that is, I'll show you on this piece, it's cool to the touch. If you look at that piece closely, that is the back side of the weld that I made. You see how it distorted the aluminum? This is the front side of the weld that I made. Okay, I did the same thing just now, and you can see what it does. It, it almost burns completely through the part. Whereas this side, not nearly as bad. I'm gonna set this hot. Mac Daddy over here. Now while you're doing that, Dexton wanted to make a comment. Okay. While he was in manufacturing, they used to use a heat treating unit where they use nitrogen to remove the air from the chamber. Same thing. Same concept. Right. Same concept. Understand. Yep. Okay. They're inerting the atmosphere. All right. Last week on the um, on the rivet demo that I did for you guys uh, I think it was Swanjin that asked me uh, just weld it on or you know why don't you weld it or do you weld in the aircraft aviation that sort of stuff the reason that we don't weld our sheet metal panels together is number one if we have damage we, we have to be able to take it apart and uh, and repair the damage and number two after I run a bead on the aluminum no matter how good it looks in aviation it's gonna crack Okay, so we stick to the pop rivets. Other than framework, tubing, and such as that, I can't think of anything 
welded on the airframe. Can you? Not on the airframe, except for general aviation, where you have the light, the truss, the uh, right, the uh, chromoly Chromo yes. truss fuselages. Uh, but that's for the uh, the hobbyist. Uh, as far as any general aviation manufacturer, unless they do that. But then, uh, you know, on the airframe, no, because of the stresses. And then uh, the only other place is the engine. There is a significant amount of welding done on turbine right. engines with exotic uh, materials. So I've got a small piece of sheet metal that I riveted on last week. I'm gonna, I have no idea how this is going to work because it's pretty hot. It may just blow that away. But I'm going to try to weld this sheet on here and uh, set it to the side. And it wouldn't surprise me if I came back later and it was cracked. But we'll see what happens. Oh look, we got a, a wire stuck. We got a little bit of uh, burn back issue. Yeah. Whenever I let go of it, I let it burn back in. That's all right. Mark Mark Dennison says he'd be welding a parachute to his ass for sure. <laughs> Mark's scared to fly. I know. Yeah. And by the way, Char Charlie Gabaldon just showed up. Okay, hey Charlie. Watch your video today. I, I was a little late watching it because I had a lot going on. But it was a great video, man. I like that song. This is another problem you run into with aluminum especially. Uh, a lot of times what will happen... Have extra tips. Yeah, man. have ep extra tips. And I do, and I may grab one. But the wire welds itself to the end. Sometimes you can get it out. Sometimes you can't. And I'm not having real good luck with it right now, so I'm probably just going to change the tip. Yeah. Right. Now, while the captain's We're getting his equipment. gun ready, I will say this about welding. Pretty much any metal can be welded. You could even weld this. Would it be correct? Mm -hmm. No. But you could actually glue it together. Would it be safe? No. <laughs> Maybe for a couple of flights. <laughs> but uh, no, it's not something that you do because of the forces on a uh, airframe or fuselage structure. Oh, by the way, guys, uh, uh, Scott here is actually uh, my old flight instructor. Uh, we used to work together and on the maintenance side, and uh, he taught me quite a bit. But now you're I, you're an instructor now, over at the schoolhouse, right? Over at Shaw, right? That's correct. Yeah. Still trying to retire. Well. Now they actually have some aluminum rods, stick welding rods, or SMAW shielded metal arc welding that you can use. I had to use one of those uh, about two or three weeks ago in a hard to access uh, area. Not the preferred method, but sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. That's one thing about welding. Doesn't matter who you are, how well you do it, you're going to run into problems. This stuff right here happens constantly. Um, there's always a problem. That's with anything though, really, you know. Yes, um, Toga is asking, what type of NDT do you use primarily on the helix? Non-destructive testing? Yeah. Um, okay. Eddy current, I mean all kinds of flux, die penetrant, both the whole gamut. We use a lot of uh, Magnaflux. Magnaflux, yeah. yeah. Magnaflux. Toga is studying aviation in Ireland. Right. Oh, Ireland. Yeah. Yep. yeah, we use all kinds. All right, I'm going to try this one more time. If it doesn't work, I'll just move on. X-ray, ultrasonic, all of it. Right. Especially welding, use X-ray. Let's give that a go. Hopefully it will work this time. Right. 
so that weld there sounded better than the first ones that I did. I probably should have changed that tip previously. But as I suspected, I couldn't move fast enough, honestly, on this thin sheet metal. The, and what it does, it tries to burn out. If you look at that corner right there, you can see where it didn't weld all the way over. Okay, and the whole time I was welding that, the sheet metal was running away from me just like that. So I kind of had to backfill it. And um, if that was two pieces of thinner or thicker aluminum, yeah, it'd be fine. But that will crack. It will crack right along that well. Let That's me uh, let me add. Uh, let me give it a pointer here. When you're welding, it's a process of displacing the metal. Now, what we're doing here is called short circuit wire welding or MIG welding, where that wire actually touches several hundred times per second and it's gouging that parent metal out of the way. Well, what happens is, is that you have to replace that parent metal with filler metal. In this case, it's aluminum. You have to give the puddle time to replace that displaced parent metal because what you will get if you travel too fast, especially on steel, is you'll get a, uh, a uh, what do I want to call it, a, uh, a uh, feature basically, uh, I'll think of the name here shortly, I'm trying to search for it, it's called undercut. Undercut. Yeah. And undercut leads to weld failure down the road, guaranteed. Because undercut is mm -hmm. the area where you join, in this case, this is a lap joint, it's, uh, it didn't adequately fill in where you displace the parent metal and right. it will fatigue and fail there. I've seen it many, many times. It wouldn't surprise me if that was cracked after it cools. Well, because I mean, it, it might last a while. It looks good yeah. for a little bit, but then... It's going it's to yeah. crack, I would say, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah, at, 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 at some point. All right, just for the fun of it, I'm going to weld these two together because I got the welder working better and I just want to. Know, so this spot has a lot to show everybody too. Mm -hmm. You're just you're three minutes after three to keep you on track. All right. Okay. This is the last I'm doing with this. Mm -hmm. All right. Move the camera where you guys yeah, can see, see it. The camera situated where they can see us. <coughs> there we go. All right. One last pass. Well, lady Lucifer is here. Hey, Lady Lucifer. Good to see you. It's bad when you got to swap glasses. Alrighty, not too bad. You probably heard a little pause there. That was a piece of something impure in the metal. And what happens is, is while I'm welding and that rod's burning, especially on aluminum, back that up where you guys can see it a little bit better. You got a little off center there, babe. Yeah, I'm gonna zoom out just a bit. He suggested you guys hang on. So there's something in that's impure in the metal, and with aluminum, you have to have a constant ground. And what happened right about there is where it happened. You had just a moment where I lost the ground from the welding wire going in because there was some kind of impurity right there. That's why you kind of heard it start and stop real fast. That's And I didn't really bother even cleaning it. So perfect example of why you want to clean your metal before you start welding on it. All right, that's going to do it for this aluminum welder. We're going to move it out the way. And uh, uh, I'm going to do just a couple of stick welds just in the interest of time, and then we'll move on from there. Scott, will you unplug that right there, please? It's right up behind the bandsaw. I'll just roll this right up. And you guys can probably tell it's quite cramped in here. My welders usually stay next door, but for this, every, all the cameras and everything are set up in here, so I decided to bring them in. 
two quick things. Number one, Kevin Godding has joined us. All right. Number two, Simon has a question for you guys. Can you get an electric shock from a welder? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I thought can. that was right, but I wanted y'all to talk about it. Normally, yeah, so normally, if everything's dry and it's grounded properly, it's not going to be an issue. Um, but if you have any sweat, when you're wet, or you lay on the ground, which I've done that. Well, you do that a lot working in the field, don't you? Yeah, and, and it happens from time to time, and it'll get your tension. I guarantee. Yes. Nothing like getting juiced up. That bottom welder, Scott, will you turn it on? The left, top left, just rotate it to the right. There you go. The last time I used this little stick welder, I think I was welding 6011. And uh, which reminds me, um, this is where I wanted to talk to uh, Scott Guitar. So when you're starting out welding, um, you go buy you a welder, and you don't know anything about the welding rods. Like I said, there's different welding rods. So <clears throat> to start out, my recommendation would be an easy rod, something like this rod. It, it's, it's very small in diameter. It burns really easy. It's a 6011, you get good penetration with it. It's just a general all around rod. I like this rod because whenever I weld on equipment that's been out in the field and there's a lot of rust and stuff like that, this rod burns through a lot of that crap. It's not so hot that it burns through like a 6010, it's just hot enough to burn through all the rust and, and help you get a good weld. But you always wanna clean your metal as best you can, no matter what. Like the 6010, the 6011 is called a fast freezing rod. It's used to whip and pause. Pipeliners use that initially to make right. your, your initial uh, pass. That's what a hot pass is. A hot pass. Yeah. And then, but it's the cousin of the 6010. It's a whip pause. It just doesn't have as much penetration, but also this can run on AC. 6010 is strictly DC. Right. This is an AC DC rod. And that's something to consider if you're wanting to get into any kind of welding. There's AC and DC, so all rods are not created equal. As a matter of fact, I'm going to weld with one rod that's specifically designed to run DC, but I'm going to run it on AC just to show you it can be done, but it's not as efficient and it's a little slower and it's hard to get started. And also, one real quick addition to that if you're running DC, you can also change the polarity and the manufacturer will tell you if the rod is designed to run electrode positive or electrode negative. Now I run 6013s uh, which is like an auto body, it's a shallow penetrating rod but it can be run on DC positive and DC negative polarity but DC negative has lower penetration so when you're doing the really thin stuff you just switch your polarity and make it uh, electrode negative. Okay, and Scott, what do the two numbers represent? Oh, there's four numbers. Yep. Okay, Simon said two. So in this, in this case, we're talking about. in this case, that 100 rod uh, that, that's, that that's he was talking 18. about, the initial, the initial two on this one here is 7018. This is a low hydrogen rod. Right. These should be put in an oven. I mean, if you're welding the code. Brady, you want to show that to the camera so that they see what he's talking about? Yeah, show him. Yeah. Show, show. Which one did you get? Excalibur 718. It's a 1 8 inch rod, 7018. The 70, the first two digits, refer to the tensile strength. In this case, it's 70,000. The second two numbers, the number one, indicates that it's an all position rod. And it can be welded flat, horizontal, vertical, and overhead. Just can't run them downhill. And the eight refers to it's a low hydrogen rod. So the last number is what type of flex that it uses. This one right here, it has 100, 1, 6. Well, the 100 is 100,000 PSI tensile strength. 1 means it's in all position, and the 6 is referring to the flux that it uses, either a rutile or well hybrid. And real quick before you fire anything up, okay. Mark D wants to know, do you have a plasma welder? He's talking to you directly. Me? Yes. I do not have a plasma, a, a, a plasma is a plasma cutter. Uh, a heliarc or TIG welder is a TIG welder. But uh, when we talk about plasma, we talk about, uh, it's like a thermal arc and air blows the, uh, once you, once you. I have one on my truck. Once you uh, start a puddle with the plasma, 
and get it red hot and molten, the air coming through the plasma blows that metal out of the way. That's why when you cut something with a plasma, if it's relatively thin, eighth inch, whatever, you can pick it right up if it's not hot. Is that your dog? Is there a dog? There's a dog that just walked in the shop. I don't know whose it is. Is it the neighbors? Is it Miley? <laughs> it's a brown dog. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't guess it hurt. Hey, get, go. You can go ahead and shut the door. There, there you go. We'll keep it. Bye, doggy. But at any rate, that's that's a plasma. Now, what I've got right here is that uh, 6011 rod that we were talking about. And I'm just going to run a lap joint right here on this. Now, you run an AC or DC on this? On this one is AC. That welder is strictly AC. Yeah, my, my wire welder is AC-DC. And I, it's AC-DC, and so is that one to set up for my aluminum on. That's another thing. When you weld aluminum, you need to be on AC. Well, you it, right. But this, since it's on AC, will put less heat because of the alternating current. Right. It's better on the thinner material. And it doesn't make near as free of a weld no, as DC. But, but at any rate. Taz, Taz is here and says to say roll tide. Roll tide, Taz, Taz. And uh, Katrina says basically what she's learned so far is paint, uh, welding is a pain in the ass. <laughs> There's a lot more to it than people think, that's for sure. All right, here we go. Right, you can see the stick welder is a lot more violent. Uh, it just sounds different. That's what they call buzz boxes. Buzz boxes, that's exactly right. Buzz boxes? Yeah, that's what they call. Okay. Called. Okay. Oh, the Lincoln. The Lincoln, yeah, you remember the old Tombstone. heavy, god, them were heavy. Tombstone welder? Yeah. Buzz box. So, another tool of the trade is a chip and hammer. Some of you guys may have seen one of those. And we use that to break this slag off. The slag is this ugly stuff that's on the weld. Usually after it cools, it's a little easier to get off. It's still quite hot. But don't use that brush. I'm going to step over to the uh, wire wheel and brush this off so I can show you kind of what it looks like. I'll be right back. Gang. I went ahead and brushed it off. You can see it's not the prettiest weld. It will hold. Um, but between my eyes and not being able to see it and that cheap welder, that's the best I can do with a stick welder. And this is kind of the reason I wanted to kind of ease up the ladder with this um, to show you guys that it really matters what kind of equipment you get. The cheaper equipment you buy, the uglier the welds are going to be. And you'll see here in a minute with my wire welder, it's considerably a better looking weld. You might see a weld like this on like a, a livestock trailer or uh, some just some out in the field work where farmers do the best they can with what they got. By all means, it will hold, but I would not want to give myself a grade on that as a professional welder. But that's not what I do. So uh, anyway, there you have it. That's a 6011. Telling you not to look, and I'm telling him, I, I know, I know, I'm staying out of the way. Yeah, you definitely don't want to watch somebody weld. That burn your eyes real bad. One of these days, you're going to tell a story about that trailer we worked on, but we're not going to do it right <laughs> yeah. now because we need to get, we need to make sure Scott gets to show his stuff since he's here. Yep, I'm only going to do another. Uh, I can't switch it. Okay. I have to leave it like that, the way it's set up. But I've kind of been chomping at the bits, wanting to weld with this blue rod, the mystery rod. I don't know what, the, what it is. I didn't either. 
but we're ready to find out. We're getting ready to see what it does. I, I've not adjusted the welder settings at all, so uh, it may be too hot. I don't know. We'll see. Let's take a run at it. Damn, I may be too cold. Starts like a 7018. There it goes. It welds a lot like a 7018. And the rod gets very hot. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that can hurt too much. I don't either. That's definitely a DC rod. Yeah, and that's, that's another thing about the uh, AC-DC rods. You, you don't want to uh, weld. If that rod is a DC rod, you don't want to weld on the AC because you saw what just happened. You know, the rod will melt before you get done with the weld. All right. Looks like a halfway decent piece of the slag. Yeah. So what you're seeing right now on the top of this weld is the slag, and that's all of the rod that's... Uh, that's all of the uh, flux that's on this rod is uh, on top of the weld. So as it cools, it will actually start flaking off by itself. You can see this corner's already done it. But I'll go ahead and give it a couple of taps and see if it comes off. You see how it's breaking off? Once again, I'm going to go over the uh, wire brush and brush it off so you guys can get a good look at it. And gentlemen, Scott Guitars wants to know what is the difference between arc and MIG welding? Well, technically, arc welding is referred to as SMAW, shielded metal arc welding. This is a flex shield bonded to a piece of steel rod okay. that shielded metal arc weld. As this flux burns off, it creates a shielding gas. So I can weld with this out in the open, which is my preferred when I'm out working out in the open where there's air blowing. Because if I was MIG, which is uh, GMAW, gas metal arc welding, I have to have a shielding gas. And uh, but I can also do flux core, but that's a separate, that's a subset. But he's talking about uh, just the wire welding, big welding. You need to have a shielding gas. In this case, typically it'll be uh, what we refer to as C25, 75 percent argon, 25 percent CO2, okay. and that is your shielding gas that you use. Okay. And it makes for real pretty puddles. But just remember to turn your gas on, right? Captain? That, yeah. That is, Captain didn't have the gas. That is a very professional welding. You were not. You were not locked and loaded and ready to go, were you? No. But I'm. I'm changing over to the wire welder now. The gas is in fact on. Uh, this is probably my favorite welder. Um, like I said, the other welders have their special purpose, but um, when it comes down to you know me welding something, I really prefer my wire, wire welder over any other welder that I have. So. A couple of the guys here are talking real quick about. They, they've gotten slag yes. in their eyes. Yeah. Uh, Swan Connection says it's shit to get in your eyes. It and is. I see Carl saying, yes, he ended up in the hospital once. Yes. Yeah, wear, wear, a, wear safety glasses or better yet, a shield when you're using a wire, you know, any kind of uh, grinder, wire wheel, cutoff wheel, use adequate protection because they can uh, cause serious injury. Good stuff. So here, are doing fantastic. Go for it, Captain. Here's the weld I made with that mystery rod. It's very difficult to weld with it. It, it doesn't... It almost looks like nickel. Or it does. It looks like a nickel rod. Nickel doesn't flow where the crap anyway. Yeah. Huh. A lot of... You know, I, don't, I, I don't know if that's what this rod is, but uh, when I was younger, we couldn't afford... Uh, you know, Detroit lockers, spider gear, stuff like that for the rear ends of our car. So what we'd use, we would use a high nickel rod and we would weld the spider gears, spider gears together to make a solid chunk, like, a, like an ATV axle. And uh, that's just what we did for traction back in the old school days. So 
And I've got this tubing set up. It's just some thin wall tubing. It's nothing special. I've got it set up at 90. And I'm just going to make a couple of wells with a wire welder so you guys can get a grasp of how that's going to look. Now on this, uh, before the captain starts welding, this is, uh, looks to be what, about 14 gauge yeah. tubing? Yeah. So that's thin wall tubing. He's going to be making uh, what's referred to as a, a fillet weld here. He's just joining these two pieces of uh, one's a smaller size tubing, but he's going to be aiming. He's trying to let the weld puddle wash up on this, but he's going to be aiming it down more here for the heat because if he aims it more at this, it's going to blow a hole in it. So he's going to put the heat more down here and, and manipulate the puddle to where it quote unquote washes up on the side of the smaller tube. Dutchman has to go, but he says thank you. Bye Dutchman. Bye Dutchman, I'm glad you came buddy, thanks. This is more my style of welding. I get to sit down, put my glasses on, take my time, weld it up, and you'll see it's such a better, uh, a much better look than the stick welder. Um, and the backstory on the, uh, the aluminum welder, years and years ago, um, I used to do a lot of aluminum welding on pontoon boats and aluminum tanks. And the, the, the aluminum was so thick, I could turn the welder as high as it would go, and I had plenty of time, I could make the prettiest welds with that little welder because the metal was so thick. But this thin metal that you saw me welding on a while ago is so thin, it, it burns through very quickly. Uh, but with the wire, wire welder, not so bad. So, get my welding glasses on. Do you have your prescription in your helmet? I just want to use That's what I'm doing. But yeah. I, you know, I feel fogged up if I don't have my fan. That's what this yeah, is. yeah. All right, here we go, gang. I'm gonna tack each corner and then I'll come back and weld it. Okay, let that cool off, it's a little bit cherry. Move the magnets. I don't need them anymore. It ain't going nowhere. Wouldn't you say that's a lot prettier of a weld? I would. What's that heat setting on, Steph? And Swanjin wants to know big now. Turn the no, turn the top knob. Just the front of the top. Let me get a little more speed out of it. And I haven't used this welder, so that was my wire speed was a little slower than I like. So um, I had Scott speed up the wire speed on it, and uh, that'll be an interesting weld right there. I'll weld across this end next. I'm gonna weld it. That time I pushed the weld. Okay, this time I'm gonna pull the weld. Now on a, on a, with the mid, it doesn't matter if you push or pull. Right. It, you'll see it looks pretty much identical no matter which way I go with this torch. It's just aluminum you have to <laughs> Right. Yeah, the aluminum you need to push it for the penetration and just the way it works. But uh, for the wire, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you may see a little different pattern, but other than that, it's strictly cosmetic. But I'll, I'll pull it to me this time so you can, you can see what I'm talking about. So you guys can see that weld, it, it, it pretty much matches that weld. There's not really a lot of difference in it. 
Okay. Well, what are you using? Is that 030 or 030? 030. 030. Yeah. It's a little bit smaller, and I, I use the. What Scott asked me is, is it 035 thousandths wire or 030? And I use the smaller wire because every now and then I'll do some body work on someone's vehicle, and it's great for sheet metal. And I do a lot of this tubing welding too. Um, I'm fixing to weld up this gap. You can see that gap right there. It's a pretty good gap. And this is why welders love wire welders, because we can fill those gaps easily, no problem. I say that and I'll burn right through this thing. All right, here we go. Voila. do one last weld and then we'll talk about some things. I'll set the camera back up in front of me and Scott and uh, we'll probably walk out to the truck and take a quick look at some of his equipment. So I'm going to do one last weld and I'm going to try to demonstrate. This metal is a quarter inch thick, okay? This is a half, approximately a half inch square. That's pretty thick metal and the purpose that I want, the, the reason I want to weld this together after I get it welded, I'll show you um, why it's important you have the right heat settings. Now, I've welded this stuff with my little welder before, and I know how to apply enough heat to it. Um, so it will be a good weld, and it will hold. But once I get done, I want to point a few things out and show you guys. Captain, almost 3.30, okay? All right. All right. If I can zoom that in for you guys. And Simon wants to know, it may just have been a time thing. I don't know that he says that you did three sides, why not the last one? Was it just a time thing? <laughs> If, he, if Simon wants me to weld that third side, or fourth side, I can go ahead and do it. Well, we I just, do just in the interest of time, Simon, I wanted to move on. While he's here, gets to show all right. his stuff. You can do a second welding if you want. Reach down there and grab that, Scott. Yeah. Put your tongue on it. Yeah. All right, guys. That's the weld I just made. I'm zoomed way in. But you can see what I wanted to point out. I started from this, from this end going that way. And you can tell this end is blue now. That's because it got really hot. But if you look closely, you can see the weld started actually penetrating better because the further I went along, the hotter this piece got, and it helped with the penetration. So there is a, uh, that's a thing you always have to consider when you're welding something more, you know, in length on these, is you have to consider warpage, and you have to have a strategy on what gets welded first, because you don't want to put a lot of heat in on it, or else what it is you're trying to weld will actually warp and bend even this uh, quarter inch tubing. Right. So you actually would do like a series of stitch welds and tie them in right. so that you keep the heat, uh, you know, relatively constant. And to add to that, let's just say that, that for whatever reason I had a six foot long piece of this material, this half inch material, and I had a piece of six foot long tubing and I had to weld them together for maybe a, some kind of track or for something to ride on. Well, you would never ever want to weld all the way down the piece because it will warp, and not to mention warp any pressure. If you ever develop a crack in the weld, if you don't have gaps between some of your welds, the crack will fall the full length of whatever it is you've welded on. 
Not to mention, it's probably gonna look like a banana by the time you get done welding it because all the heat on this side is gonna push it the opposite direction. So you'd wanna do a stitch weld. Well, what I'm talking about, the strategy that you would use, let's say this was about three foot long, you would start a bead here and go to there. Then you'd start a second bead and go up to the end of the first bead and then just put them together to make a longer right. bead like, like that. That helps control the heat. The whole time you're welding something, I don't know if you guys can even see this rod. Where the hell am I? All right, the whole time you're welding, on a picture this as a piece of steel that you're welding down the sides. The whole time you're welding, that piece is bending, okay? And Scott's right, you, you can't just start here and go to here or the part would look something like that. <laughs> You're gonna to have to use a strategy to where you weld here, here, you know, back and forth and maintain uh, the, the straightness of your workpiece. Just some other things to think about, you know, you newcomers to welding, don't just pick up a welding rod and weld the full length of something, it will warp. And you'll see too that when he put his tacks on this piece of tube, the initial tacks pulled that piece of tube over. And that's why I had to weld the gap up. Yeah, because it actually pulled the piece of metal, and sometimes that's a strategy where you will set it up deliberately like that and put your weld to pull it straight. Captain Toka had to go. I didn't want to interrupt you. Right. I think he's already gone. No but worries. Anyway, you have to go. Now, do y'all want to yep, sit outside? I'm fixing to take the, f the phone Let out of this. Let me everybody. Give me just a second, gang. Take a little train the main. Did Lammy ever make it? Lammy actually didn't make it, but yeah. I know what he'll, he'll watch the replay. He probably That's got fine. tied up doing something. All right, let's see. I wonder if I can spin this around. Are we going out to the truck? Uh, yeah, I guess. All right. I'm turning you guys around. I'm just turning this around to where I can hold the camera. out of you guys this way. Um, you're, you're, you're gonna hold the camera for Scott, right? Okay, good, good. All right, gang, here we go. Oh, there's a new bandsaw, by the way. It works great. That's what I need. All right, gang. This is a professional welder's rig right here. This is what one looks like. I'll give you a walk around and I'll meet Scott on the other side. There's his logo. Patriot Welding. You may have to explain that Scott does things in the field. Right. The Scott's a portable, uh, a full portable welding. So anything I can do in the shop welding wise, Scott can do out in the field. Just much bigger scale and a lot, lot more bold and larger equipment. As you can tell by the truck, it's set up pretty good. Now the little stick. That's one of them, but I'll tell you, you're going to be surprised at the one I use most often. I have it sitting on the back, but this is the engine drive uh, that I use. Uh, it's a Miller Trailblazer 325, 325 amps, and it has a remote feature. I can run my spool gun. I have 30 feet of spool gun here. Now yours, is yours wire, wire thir yeah. 35? Yeah, this, okay. this right here is 035. I have my Argon and my C25 bottles on there, <clears throat> but I can run this straight off of the trailblazer for the uh, stick welding I have 100 foot rolls of uh, 2 watt cable which rarely comes off the spool because most of the time I have 50 feet coiled up right here for my ground and my electrode that I just pull right off of the side when I pull up right. for a job it's all my uh, some extra smaller shorter cabling in there all my different welding rods my helmet, gloves, file, just all the uh, odds and ends. There's so many different kinds of rods that you can use. I can give you some examples. This right here is a hard facing rod. This is what you would put on like a excavator bucket or a bulldozer blade or, or the teeth. Mm -hmm. And it uh, provides uh, much greater wear resistance. Uh, some people have actually elevated it to an art form, actually applying hard facing which is very tedious work these right here these uh blue demon 8000 the bd 8000 call them the angry beaver 
I use those for boring holes. So if I need a base plate, instead of drilling holes, just burn through it. With I just the rod. burn through it. That's designed yeah. to burn through. Okay. Now, if I have something real stubborn, I have a thermal lance or an oxygen right. lance right. that I use. You showed me that the other day. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I can burn through real stubborn stuff. But that's all the electrodes. This right here is the steel stick welder. It's also a TIG DC TIG, not an AC TIG. It's a DC TIG. But it's made by Fronius. USA. I think it's either German, Austrian, or Swiss. But not a very inexpensive machine. But it's probably one of the best investments and probably the most used welder that I have. And what's nice about it, I guess this would be a little advertisement for Fronius. Comes with a nice case, but it's a little 19 pound welder, portable. And I can burn a 1 8 inch 7018 rod at 120 amps yeah. on 330 feet of extension cord. Guys, that's about half the size of the little stick welder I was using and about 50 times better. And it, uh, it also uses, uh, or it can also do the TIG. Now I end up, also on the truck I have my wire welder right over there. It's a voltage sensing. That, Screen, screen right there. That's what I do right now. It's set up for uh, MIG, just like we had in the uh, shop. But uh, what I typically will use that for is my flux core for the heavy machinery when I'm running like the uh, 72 thousandths wire, the right. flux core. Because when you get up into your thicker metals, your thicker material, that little machine in the shop it's only good to about five sixteenths. Oh yeah, at best would be welding something surface to this. Yeah. I'm not going to get the penetration near enough to, to make quality, long, durable yeah. welds. And that one, I can run MIG and gas or flux core, but the thing about flux core is that it's just like stick. You use MIG up to a point and then you go to stick because of the penetration, but also because you don't right. have to use gas. That's why I, well, nine times out of ten, pull up and weld something with the little stick welder. Right. It's less hassle. I don't have to use shielding gas, which is not cheap. No. Uh, you know, because I'm usually outside. Right. Okay. And uh, moving right along, uh, more storage in here. Uh, just to kind of show you, being a mobile welder, I have to kind of be prepared for all situations, but I have limitations because my truck, I can only carry so much. But I've learned being mobile and off site and probably in remote areas that I have to kind of plan for every right. contingency. A port of band saw, my gas torches, more uh, drills in here, and uh, sawzalls, the hammer drills. Then here is just more just odds and ends stuff. It's so my torch, oxyacetylene, and the wheel. But the back seat is where I end up in a shop. You've got in my this truck. Hypertherm 40 XP right. plasma. That is a uh, set of two inch uh, sockets for heavy okay. equipment. Yeah. This is a Milwaukee three quarter inch that'll bust the rusted nuts off of a right. caterpillar, no problem. Mm -hmm. Then a hammer drill. And then this I found to be an absolute, I have two different sizes, it's a rib nut. Oh, set. rib nut set, yeah, yeah. I These bet that does come in so handy. handy. Then also, I have for gouging whenever there's a crack on heavy equipment, you have to find the point of origin and the uh, where it stops, and then you have to gouge out and find parent metal, so you're making a little valley. Right. And then you fill it back in. Well, this is carbon arc gouging, has right. these special rods right here that will just place it, just blows that metal out. It's like, it's similar to your, uh, uh, I can gouge with my uh, hypertherm. Yeah, hypertherm, yeah. I can do delicate stuff with this. Right. And with the, uh, with the addition, uh, or the additional uh, uh, 
accessories, the high access accessories right. allow me to get into tight spots, but this is where you have to re remove serious metal. Helmets, uh, harnesses, leather, all my PPE, hose, three quarter inch drive, ratchet set. God knows what's under the seat. I can't yeah. remember, but there's a ton of stuff. Pay attention to something that Simon said. This is a learning experience for you. And then quality is tanked. You might be pushing the limits. For those of your 70, life, uh, yeah. Okay. The 7018 rods right. that the captain was talking about, those have to be baked in an oven. And right. This is a portable oven. It heats them up to 350 degrees. I usually heat it up the night before. And it's all full of the low hydrogen rods. Probably burn a lot better than what I was trying to burn in there. Well, they'll still burn, but I mean, yeah. they, they absorb the humidity. Right. We're in a high humidity area here. So anything that they may absorb ambient, then you have to kind of bake it. Right. They're normally kept in a shop in a, in a bigger oven, but this one here, if you're welding the code or if you're just concerned that mm -hmm. you want the, uh, you know, in order to achieve this specify, you know, the, the spec right. on the rod, the 70,000, it has to be done in accordance. Every <clears throat> everything that you do on a job or if you're working structural has specifications and it's AWS is what we use here in the United States and it's a, a very thick book. Right. And they have procedures that are already established and there's procedures that you can establish if you have something special and then they will sign off on it but it's a whole book full of all the different types of welding and if you go to any drawings on a structure it will specify that the welds will be done by a certified welder on this procedure so if anyone ever asks or are you certified welder well there's that book is that thick yeah and there's thousands of procedures so normally that's reserved if i'm working for somebody at a manufacturing facility and they might use a couple different procedures right then i would be certified okay. and tested on those because those particular they're items. expensive right it's yeah. about 350 400 dollars right. to get certified Dougie right. Doug is here and everybody hey, Dougie, is Doug. giving scott huge shout that's outs awesome. about his rig and all of his equipment that's fantastic and, yes. we're going to go back in the shop and sit down i'll face the camera back towards us we'll finish <laughs> up with any questions you guys got and uh and we'll go from there just do you see mark do you see marky Mark Dennison said, I want this live, Scott. Yeah, three miles. Yeah. Let me move this out of the way. All right, guys. Well, Scott's putting something away in his truck. I got to go out and come back in real quick, Captain, right. because my phone has locked up on me. Okay. I know. So I'll be right back. Just one second. Did I tell you Dougie Doug was here? Yes, hi Dougie Doug. I'm if sorry. I didn't say hi, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't even remember if I told you or not. So, one thing I gotta show Scott right now. Are you up on the 25 dollar bandsaw? No. I bought that bandsaw at a yard sale for 25 dollars and then converted it to metal. It cuts yeah. sheet metal like you can't believe. I, I bet you I've used that thing a hundred times in these videos when I do these little sheet metal parts over on the mill or whatever. That thing, I don't like using it vertically because I don't have a plate for a, a surface. But uh, but that's a great, that's the bandsaw I told you I picked up from my neighbor. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a good one. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great bandsaw. It's a great bandsaw. But um, all right, guys, listen. Um, I'm looking through my bifocals at my monitor so I can see who all is here. Mm -hmm. Dougie Doug, Mark, thanks for coming. Uh, Carl H, thanks for coming, buddy. You're always here. Do you guys have anything you want to ask Scott while he's here, you know, right here in front of us? Uh, feel free. Ask Scott or me. We'll answer whatever well, questions we can. While they're thinking of a question, I'll just tell you what I'm currently working on. I get all kinds of uh, odds and ends. It isn't always heavy equipment. Right now, I think this is probably the third one I've done. But uh, we're close to Fort Rucker here. We have some of these uh, people waiting to get the, uh, you know, sequence into flight school. And so they have some time on their hands. And uh, there's been a few of them, young men that come by and uh, they want to build these retro bikes, either a, uh, a uh, cruiser chopper or a, uh, like a cafe racer retro. 
Uh, the current one I have right now is a 1997 Yamaha Virago, and he's making it a hardtail. So I'm having to modify the frame, and what I'm the process I'm using there uh, to some degree is the uh, MIG uh, brazing with uh, silicon bronze, uh, which is a different process. That's the thing that people, a lot of people don't understand that there's so many processes and then there's subsets of these processes and each one is used for a different situation. In this case, silicon bronze has a much lower melting point, probably by about a thousand degrees. Uh, it will melt before the parent metal melts because I'm dealing with thin wall tubing. So uh, I actually put the, it's MIG brazing, not TIG brazing or ga oxyacetylene gas brazing. It puts it on uh, with the, uh, the MIG uh, synergic machine that I have, an HTP uh, ProPulse 220 MTS. Very uh, sophisticated machine, but uh, there's so many different, uh, different processes that you can use. But like I said, I'm using this one because it's thin wall tubing and I don't want to blow through it. Right. Scott, you've got a couple of people asking you, uh, how long have you been welding? Well, I guess I could go back to uh, when I went through uh, to get my aircraft mechanics license back in 1979. So since then. A while. Off and on, a while. All right. And that was oxyacetylene. Again, it's and, old and school. Stick. You remember we could do that with a clothes hanger? Yeah. Have you done that lately? No, they I don't know. No. The clothes hangers we get now, they used to yeah. back in the day, we'd weld up exhaust pipes and just do whatever. And we'd use a cutting torch and just use the heat off of it and use the clothes hanger, metal clothes hanger, as a filter rod. And man, it was fantastic. I can't tell you how many old hot rods I built and did all my exhaust work with a clothes hanger and a torch. But, uh, you know, just for giggles here a while back, <laughs> I was at a friend's house and I saw his torch and uh, his laundry is done outside in the garage as well. And I said, hey man, let's, uh, let, me, let me weld something with that torch. He goes, yeah, sure. So I grabbed a, a coat hanger and uh, I tried to weld like we used to with a coat hanger. It, 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 it doesn't a, it pull up. It has a lacquer coating yeah. on it too. And it, it, it's got some yeah. kind of lacquer coating and it, yeah. it just breaks off as you heat it. There's no flow whatsoever. Yeah. I was really surprised by that. but. Um, but anyway, guys, uh, keep your seat. Keep your seat. I'm just coming. I promise I would say hi to everybody. All right. Mrs. wants to but say hi. I can hi. squeeze in. Hi, everybody. Hey, Lady Lucifer wanted me to come say hi. Oh, okay. Thanks, guys, for being here. We really appreciate it. I'm so glad that y'all came to meet Scott and let him show all y'all his stuff because he has amazing stuff. These two right here, you keep them together for too long, two things are going to happen. Number one, beer's going to be drank. And number two, Lots of crazy stuff is going to be built. Yeah. That's just the way That's they fine. roll. That's just so. the way it works. But anyway, I'm going to just go ahead and uh, say my goodbyes to everybody. Um, Mark, glad you came, buddy. And uh, look forward to seeing you stream this weekend. Um, oh, that reminds me. I got to announce something right now. So next weekend, or next week, all next week, for the full week, I will be in Panama City. I will not be here uh, to do a live stream on Wednesday. Uh, we we're we're going to uh, we'll be moving our little beach house. We're moving stuff from there, and uh, long story. I'll get into that later. But anyway, I will not be streaming next Wednesday. So, uh, Sherry Lynn, I meant that is she here? She is not here, okay. but she. Will, I think her and Patrick watch a replay. So. We hope uh, you're safe, yeah, from, hope the you're safe from the weather yesterday. The yeah. lamb, I got the material in to do your guitar knobs. I'll get started on them pretty quick. I'll do. I'll, I'll probably do a live short on that because that won't take very long. Exploring with Carl, um, I'm going to get with you. I'd like to get the uh, the shirt that you had and maybe a hat or something like that. And uh, I'd like to say hi to Gibbo. Gibbo, I appreciate the offer on the flag. I really do. Uh, if you want to send me one, feel free to. But um, I've got a pretty good lineup on, on all my flags. And uh, get those from Australia. Yeah. yeah. Some of these, a lot of these folks on here are from Australia, United Kingdom, um, Ireland, uh, Germany, uh, Wales. The United States, Wales. And uh, just so you know, I, each time I do a uh, stream, they, a lot of people send me their flag of yeah. their, or their country or their cool. state or whatever. And I just fly it up there, you know, put yeah. it up and let everybody kind of see it. 
But anyway, guys, that's going to wrap it up for us. Um, I appreciate all you guys coming along. Don't forget about Mark's show tomorrow and Saturday. Of course, the Lamb on Monday. I'm skipping Wednesday. Charlie will be on Tuesday. Uh, Jimmy Ribble will be on Tuesday as well. So uh, you guys come see us all. And yeah. That's about all I've got for you guys. I'm glad y'all came along. Thank you, everybody, for being here. If we didn't call your name, I'm sorry. We just got a little tied up, but we love you all. Y'all know that. All right, guys. I'll see you guys on the other stream, and <laughs> I will see you in two weeks. And on a side note, uh, the captain invited me over here because I inquired about uh, a YouTube channel myself. I've always been interested in that, and uh, glad he invited me over here today to uh, participate. Uh, little side note, I'm also a professional photographer. Oh, that's right, yeah. And uh, I don't, uh, I have all the equipment, but I just haven't really crossed that bridge yet about the uh, YouTube. So just uh, conducting an informal poll, uh, poll, let the captain know if you think uh, you'd be interested in me uh, starting up a, uh, a a page of my own and documenting my uh you know, goings on with the uh, mobile welding, you know, uh, on site uh, stuff. I think you do good. I think a lot of people show a lot of interest in yeah. that. You know. And I get, I get questions of all types, not just welding and machining. You know, we talk a lot of piano, guitar, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm constantly making stuff for people. There's a pizza cutter over there that's been to Ireland twice that I can't seem to get it to customs. Uh, I don't understand what that's about. That's for Toga. That's for Toga. I apologize. Man, I just, I no think telling how those terrorists can use the pizza cutter. And, uh, by the way, guys, y'all may have missed this. Taz Taz, mm -hmm. that, by the way, is, is new, so we're glad you're here. Oh, hey. But, yeah, yes, two here. military guys right here. Taz Taz says he is from Fort Rucker and Fort Borden. Fort yep. Rucker and Fort G Borden. Mm -hmm. Okay, I know we're both those places. Shout out to you. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. All right. You got anything else, Scott? Mrs.? No? I'm good. good. Love you all, Scott. It's it's more your show this time. Oh. What you want to say? <laughs> You're here. No, oh, thanks for uh, thanks for joining, and uh, you might see more of me here with the captain, or uh, perhaps my own yeah channel one day. Either way, Carl H just said need to see you in a channel, Scott. Yeah, there you go. Carl uh, Carl H is a uh, uh, he's damn, he's an point. engineer. He's an engineer of some as well. Sort. Now, I don't remember in, in his in, in the UK, an engineer is basically <laughs> a machinist yeah. mechanic. Mm -hmm. So he's also an engineer. Um, I made Carl a soft blow hammer. So a little pecker? Yeah. Did you say that? Yeah, a little pecker. Yeah. A little pecker video. Yeah. Yeah. I, this is, I made Carl one of these, and why I did not make him ends, I don't know. I, I just I didn't think about it. It's for the same reason he forgot to hook up his gas. Yeah, I forgot to hook the gas up. Man, he's getting I'm older. <laughs> he is right. I did hit 50. He ain't that old yet, though. <laughs> All right, guys, it's been fun. It's been fun. It's a fun, uh, we need fun stream. That, we need to tell them we appreciate them staying. I, we held them over longer. Yeah, I held you guys over a little bit longer Thanks than we normally do. So I appreciate you guys staying with us. And uh, I'm going to sign off for now. And uh, I'll catch you guys in two weeks. Bye-bye. Love y'all. See you later.